We're on a road trip this morning, about 30 miles from the Pacific Ocean. We're down at Rod Janke's shop. He's the Babbitt guy. And we're going to go inside and see how to pour Babbitt today, how he does it. He's a machinist, been doing this for quite a while, quite an enthusiast. He's got some interesting saws in here we're going to take a look at also. Hey, this is Rod Janke. He's our uh, instructor today on Babbitt's. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Rod? Well, I started doing Babbitt bearing work well, about 35 years ago. Um, I used to help an old guy about 40 miles, 50 miles from here that used to work in a Ford remanufacturing facility back in the 30s. And uh, I always had Model A's and I kind of wanted to learn how to do my own work so I didn't have to wait or pay someone to do it. So I started to help him out quite a bit and, and he was in his mid-80s at the time. And uh, he took me and showed me all the different processes and different ways to use the tools and, and how to set up. And I took machining in school, so, and I am actually a machinist by trade. And uh, so I've just kind of grown through the years, uh, just learned, you know, here and there and trial and error and watched a few videos on how to do things and bought the equipment. But uh, when he got sick, he passed away. His son didn't want any of the equipment, and I got a phone call to basically come down and get it out of his way. So we brought it here. And uh, I've been doing it just mostly for myself for, for years. And once in a while if somebody needs something I can help them out. Um, that's about, about how it started for me. Well this is a 1928 Ford Model A engine block which is a four in place, cast in place Babbitt engine. And the first step in this process to do it properly is to clean the block properly. It has to have no oil or grease, no anything that can cause the, Bab or the molten Babbitt to cause carbon or and then you'll wind up with porosity, you'll wind up with a uh, very unclear or unclean pour. Uh, so we, we put it in a like a basically a large dishwasher with caustic soda in it and let it run for about an hour. Okay, what's this thing? And this is a hot water wash, a jet wash. Uh, it has 12 jets that put out about 2,500 PSI. Um, it's got a turntable on the bottom which you set the block or whatever parts you're going to clean in it and turn it on. And it forces a caustic soda solution, basically in a high acidic solution at 2,500 PSI, rotating and so it cleans every part of the block inside and out. That gets rid of all the grease, oils, and anything that's in there that we can't have. Good. From the caustic hot wash, then it goes into the steel abrader. Uh, this machine has very fine steel round shot and an impeller in the bottom. It spins about 3,000 RPM. This throws the steel shot at whatever part you put into it. This rotates as it goes so it cleans every bit of the of the part that you put into it. So the block can sit in here? Yeah the block sits in there on the, on the rails. You put more rails there's different hold, holding bars. Oh I see. And they go in different spots in the ends. You can adjust it. And you can adjust it. Put heads. It'll do anything you can put in there. Connecting rods you'd hang on the you know, and then there's a small parts basket that goes with it that you can put small pieces in and it goes into the system. So this is a nice machine. It's a, when things come out of it, they come out completely clean and almost as new. They ever did. Uh, they come out with a nice gray, freshly clean machining, machinable surface. Okay. Well, there's several different grades of Babbitt metal. Each one has a different purpose. There's no grade Babbitt for low speed uh, applications, low pressure, and then there's uh, nickel Babbitt, which is what we use in the engines in the higher speed applications that we have. Uh, nickel comes in bar form or ingot form. It has usually three or four compositions. Uh, one is usually lead in the lower speed. The nickel is more of the high speed. It also has copper and antimony, which basically makes the composition to where it is stable, holds together. Well, the nickel will help it to uh, basically you have the hardness it needs and it, it won't usually burn out with the higher speeds and the different lubrication that you have. You need to know what kind of Babbitt 
you need for whatever you're trying to use, uh, the improper product won't hold up. So what would be a <laughs> high speed uh, application? Uh, the Model A engine, the Model T engine, the Ford flathead, any old engine that's okay. going to turn over okay. about 800 RPM on the shaft speed. <coughs> then you would want to go with the Nickel Babbitt. Um, it, it's designed for that. Uh, so low, low speed would be more like a hit and miss engine? Yeah, hit and miss engine or a large, a larger journal style engine, something that shaft speeds under, you know, four or five hundred RPM, yeah. then the, the lead base. The lead base will hold up a little bit better to, like, grease for lubricant rather than using oil. Uh, so that's what that would be for. Like, a line shafts would be like a lead, you could use a lead base, Babbitt, uh, things like that. But if you're going to do an engine, a gas engine, high speed, you're going to want to use a, a nickel-based high speed Babbitt. <coughs> That it usually shows on it what it is. Sometimes it's not real clear. Um, generally, if it says, uh, if it just says anti friction, nine times out of ten, that's a lead based Babbitt. And uh, you'd want to use that on, you know, a lower speed application. So you can still get these ingots? And yeah, these ingots. I get, I get the uh, Premier Nickel out of Seattle, out of NF Babbitt. Generally, if it just says Babbitt and nothing else, like this, then you got to look in the book and see this could be socket metal, which is what they would use to set bells on chokers for logging. Uh, you really wouldn't want to use this in a, a machinery application. It just would not be appropriate for it. This most likely is lead-based, <coughs> so this we would use for the same application. I would have to, have to check the book and see what the composition is of it. This is 4X. This is Nickel Babbitt. This is as close to the Ford original Babbitt as you can get right now. You can see it's a little shinier. Yeah, it's a different it's metal composition. It's harder. It it just, you harder. can tell it's harder just by tapping it. Um, this is Nickel. It has no lead in it. Oh, wow. So <clears throat> this is what I use on all of my uh, engine rebuilds. I don't use the 4X necessarily. I use a product from NF. Uh, metals in Seattle. It's pretty much the same thing as this with a little bit of different composition to it. But this is as close to Ford Babbitt as, as you could get. And uh, this is just fine for doing an engine. This is a different, little different style of pouring frame. This is more of a production frame. Uh, this is made by K.R. Wilson who was Ford's tool builder and these were made for dealerships uh, to Ford's factory way of manufacturing or remanufacturing an engine. So this is what, when you became a Ford dealer, you would have this tool. And this just basically sits on the block. Uh, these are ramps on either one. So they're a pouring block. Oh. So basically what you do is you preheat this whole thing and you'd have a big pot of boiling molten babbitt at 800 degrees, 900 degrees, and you just take a ladle and you would just dip it and pour, dip it and pour, dip it and pour, and then these would come loose. You pull the boring frame out, and so this rod must be the standard Ford journal size. It's a little undersized. It is undersized. Yeah, it's oh, undersized. for the oil clearance. No, because you you would line bore this after you. Oh, you'd have okay. To have, you'd have right, to have, right, right. These are pretty tight. These are made for standard. Uh, bearing only trouble a lot of times if you go 30 under or more you don't have enough material you have to shim it in order to get enough material to line bore out okay uh, but they weren't back in the old days you bought a crankshaft you didn't have grind a crankshaft you bought a new one and they were they were standard so Kara Wilson made most of their equipment for standard only and it kind of makes it it's more of a dinosaur it's just kind of an interesting fixture I don't use this fixture I don't think it's ever really been used but uh, it's kind of an interesting, it is a Ford, that's what Ford had for their tools. And this would be a, a lot quicker setup if you were just doing that one block over yeah. and over and over. Yeah, if you were doing Model A, they made it for Model T, Model A. This one says Model A. Yeah, and there's a smaller version, it's Model T, it says one down underneath there. <clears throat> but these are kind of nice, they're, they're very fast compared to setting up the other style. It's You can just pour, pour, pour. But, uh, like I said, it, they, they have their limitations of what you can do with size, so. 
this is a fixture for pouring Model A Ford uh, main bearings. And this fixture does both the rear, which is the wider thrust end, and it also does the center and the front. This fixture is basically, this is a Lemco version of an Amco FSU, which is a fast setup uh, line boring system. These fixtures came with that when you bought it. Um, this fixture is basically really nice to use. It's a top pour, so you, you, you get a real even. You get a lot of metal in there fast before it starts to be short on either side. So this, I really like using this. It just does a nice job. You just turn the ends around on it for the thrust. You'd turn it around the other way and it would go back, go on the back side. The longer side would be for the center and the front. So this basically all this does, this just, this block's already been poured, but this basically goes in here and it would sit down flat against the block. Who, who did you say made this jig? This is this is either a Lemco or an Amco. It just it they come it was the same basic design, same basic company. Um, the this, this was part of a set that had the whole line boring frame and and uh, all the machining tools that came with this. So which we do have. Are we going to get to see the line boring jig? Yeah, we can set that up on here real quick, and we can show show you how that sets up too. Tell us all about this thing, Rod. What is this? Okay, this is a this is an Amco. Uh, it's basically the same as a Lemco FSU fast setup line boring fixture. Uh, this would come after the pouring process, after you get the bearings peened, <coughs> and uh, then you would set this on it. This particular fixture will do Model A, Model B, Ford, Fordson tractor, and Chevrolet four and six cylinder. So it's it has different mounting points for different engine blocks, different centering systems. Um, these are centering fixtures for the Model A and Model B. There's one on this end. This indexes from the camshaft bore to the center line of the crankshaft. Uh, otherwise, what would happen? Otherwise, you won't. Your your if you don't have these fixtures and you don't have your any way to center it properly. This is a timing gear engine. Uh, you have about a two or three thousandths interference fit on your timing gears, and if they're not in line perfectly, you don't have that hundred millimeters between the two then your timing gear and your crankshaft gear will collide. You, they, won't, they won't have that mesh. Uh, that's what these do. These establish a true center line from an established datum point, and so you're almost guaranteed uh, the perfect fit. Nice. I see how that works. It keeps that centered before you machine it? Yes. Before you bore it? Yeah. Then you, before you, when you line bore, you take those off. You, once you get it right. all clamped in place, right. then you remove the, the uh, because you have it in the right spot with it all clamped into position, then you can do it. Correct. Very nice. Yep. Then you and if we we just set this up. Uh, it it would have normally have a feed mechanism on the back side. Um, but yeah. Where's the cutting tool? Is there? Uh, does it go on this rod? Yes. All right. This is the this is a quick way manufactured uh, cutter tool. This is actually a quick way manufactured boring bar that I it's I use it in this boring frame because I just prefer the tool setting convenience of the way that this is spring loaded and it's a lot easier to set the tool so I've modified this frame for this a little bit better system than they had originally but this is a cutter this cutter would go into holes various spots in the boring bar so that would go in like that and it would be spring loaded and this would be a locking screw so once you got your tool, you push it down, you take your micrometer, the tool setting micrometer, and you put the diameter that you wanted. It's hard to see on this scale, but and then you basically you put this over the bar and you would roll it over the top of that tool cutter. And by rolling that, you're getting the exact maximum diameter. So that's how you set your tool on this. And then you would tighten down the locking screw, and then you would feed it through. And that would, that's how you would line bore, how you'd get your finish sizes. Generally, three, two or three roughing passes and then one finish pass gives you a real clean... Would you have bearing. multiple cutter blades? or? No, not on this. I Just one, one at a time. Okay. And you can move it back and forth down the, down the job. Go ahead. Okay, this is a 
commercially made connecting rod fixture. This is made by Simplicity, and this one was made in about 1934. And uh, this will do just about any connecting rod with a thrust on it that you need to do. There's 20, about 20 different sets of dies and fixtures for it. It's different dies, um, diameter dies for the thrusts and for the for the core. Um, this machine, you unload it. This opens. The die comes out of the machine. So you can change it, you can change the back die, or you can change the thrust die. That relief is for the thrust. So this would go in here, close up the gate. This is a Model A Ford connecting rod. It's already got the die inside. This would go inside, forward, and you would release that. And that clamps the rod in place. Then you would take your Babbitt ladle and you would pour this is an open funnel. You would pour this full, right, even with the top. <coughs> and when it's all, you let it sit, let it cool. And once you do that, then you would just pop this and release it, and your connecting rod would come out rebabbited, wow. ready for machining. And the next one would go back in. That's what I like about this machine. It's so, these di these different dies are for um, uh, different rods. Yes. Yeah, they're all done in 30 seconds of an inch increments. So oh, okay. <coughs> there's different different ones for each. It was a universal machine. Um, you could either make or, or order different dies. This one has, I think, all of them that came with it. But I think it'll pour up to two, oh, two, two and a quarter inch, I think, on the broad journal. And this is just another fixture. This is for pouring, like for pouring this bronze back bearing. You'd use it, that fixture. Same principle. Same principle. It's yeah, it's not very exciting. It's just that's and it's got a bunch of different cores down here that it uses. It's just a, somebody made those. I don't know exactly who it was. It, they made a lot of them. I don't know who made that one, but they, they work for certain things. Then I use them. I use that for a steel back or for something. I'm gonna an in, inserted bearing. I'm gonna. Do that. Take a thinning compound of this, and basically you put it on like that, and, and you work it in. It's on the internet off of eBay, it's about a hundred dollars. You're just doing model A. That picture goes on like so. And we level it. pretty important if you don't. It's like trying to fill a glass of water. If you don't have the glass of water level, you don't get to draw everything up. And we're going to bring it up to about 400 degrees. And to test that, we use these handy little welding sticks. What is that? It's the thermal crayon. That's a metal it won't write until it gets to a certain specified temperature. Cool. So you go along with the heat. You were getting there already. Sitted that so it wouldn't stick to the spoon? Yeah, it helps. You want to get rid of all of your ash, it's dross, they call it. Yeah, no yeah. oxidation on top of the puddle. Yeah, you don't want to pour that in there if you can avoid it. Yeah. You just pour. Okay. Alright, we're rolling. Alright, well, we'll see what we got here. We already broke the sprue loose, so we'll take it and Take the jig off, and there you have a babbitted bearing. Now, from ready for machining. It goes to the machine, to the lathe from here. Yeah, it goes to the rod lathe from here. Uh, my father and I used to scrape them. What was that about? If you didn't have a rod machine or a machine, 
you would hand scrape them. Oh, fit. okay. You'd blue them, you'd hand fit and blue and hand fit and yeah. until you got them done. Most of your, like your larger mill bearings and things like that, you'd scrape. That's uh, what he was doing. Yeah, uh, okay. or if you just needed to do a fine fit, you know, you needed to just get a little bit a larger uh, journal and you needed to scrape it, to bab it down to make it fit. It was just a, more or less just to make it fit. Well, hey, I really appreciate you showing us all this. And uh, now I think we have a better appreciation for why this takes so long and costs as much as it does. It's uh, very labor intensive, uh, material and time, and tooling. And uh, just having somebody that knows how to do it is getting harder and harder to find. So I really appreciate it, Ron. Thanks. Yeah, you're quite welcome.